The Gospel reading is from John chapter 1, verses 29 to 42. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I, I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that, I, that he might be revealed to Israel. Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom who you see the Spirit descend and remain is, is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and he watched Jesus walk by. He exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to them, Rabbi, which translated means teacher. Where are you saying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of God. You are to be called Sepsis, which, trans, which is translated to Peter. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. That's Cephas, or Kephas, if you want it in Greek, which means rock. Okay. Who's going to pray for the preacher this morning? I told you we're going to do that from now on. Thank you, Miss Toby. Lord, we ask that we gather before you to be here and that our pastor may watch, be watched over. May you guide Pastor Terry so that she may lead us in joy and truth, give her healing and peace in the moments of trial and tribulation, bring her friends that lift her and work that fulfills her, bring her love that comes in the light of your days, gifted with grace. Amen. And thank you so much. I have a black dog. I mean, a really black dog, a big black dog. I also have a burned out porch light, which means that when my porch light is out and my dog is black, I have no idea where she is. Talk about looking for a needle in a haystack. I'm looking for a black dog on a black night, and it's hard to see her. The other day, if I had stepped out of my porch, I would have stepped right on her because suddenly she turned and I saw the whites of her eyes and thought, wow, she's right. I'm calling her, she's right under my feet looking at me. So here we are in the season of light that is known as the Sundays after Epiphany, where we talk about what we talked about very briefly. I, all I read from Isaiah this morning, which is our Old Testament lesson, was in our call to worship. And now says the Lord, I will give you as a light to the nations. My salvation may reach to the end of the earth. I'll give you as a light to the nations. And we just sang that song, didn't we? We have a story to tell to the nations. And after this sermon, you're going to get to sing, I love to tell the story. And you love to sing the song, I love to tell the story, right? I love to sing that the old hymn. We've got to get to the point where we love to tell the story instead of just sing about it in church. But I want you to look at what Jesus is called in this passage. And it says, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, who is the he? John the Baptist, his cousin, who knew him? They had known each other since before they were born. Their mothers were pregnant. And when Mary walks in, Elizabeth feels the baby leap in her womb. So they've known each other a long time. But he didn't know who Jesus was fully until it was revealed to him. And he says, here's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The first thing he says about him in this passage, John the writer of the gospel, not John the Baptist. But after me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. 
So first he's going to be revealed to Israel, and then Israel's going to reveal the light to the whole of the world. John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He's on whom you see the Spirit of the Spirit descend and remain as the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. So John sees John's revealed to John that the one that the Spirit descends on is going to be the one who is God's Son. So we've got the Lamb of God who is the Son of God. Then two disciples follow him. And they're not Jesus' disciples yet. They're whose disciples? They're John's disciples because people thought that John was out there preaching and proclaiming in the wilderness, repent and be baptized. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. They thought he might be who? Who do people think John might be? They thought he might be Jesus. You're right. He might be the Son of God, the Messiah. They thought he might be Elijah come back. Some even thought he might be Isaiah, the great prophet of Israel. But they're, they're disciples of John at this point because John is the one who's preaching and proclaiming. And then they're standing there with John and two of the disciples, and Jesus goes by and he says, Look, here is the Lamb of God. Lamb of God. Not just your typical sacrificial lamb that people would take to offer at the temple, but the Passover Lamb of God, the one whose blood marks people as saved from the great fate of death. So we got the Son of God, the Lamb of God. And they see him coming, and they ask, Jesus sees them behind him, following him, and he says, well, first they call him what? What do they say to him then? Rabbi, teacher, teacher. And he says to them, what are you looking for? And then we see that he's also the Messiah, because that's what Andrew proclaims. We found the Messiah, the anointed one. So you got all these things being said about Jesus, and Jesus is asking them a question. What are you looking for? So that's my question to you today. What are you looking for? Who's got an answer to that one? What are you looking for? We need to ask ourselves that all the time. What am I looking for? What are you looking for when you come into this building? What are you looking for when you come into this room? What are you looking for when you open this Bible? What are you looking for? Who's got an answer to that? Anybody have an answer? What are you looking for when you come in here to worship? What are you looking for? Joy. You're looking for joy. Where's Miss Alexa? Alexa's got this great bag this morning that talks about having a bag full of joy. There she is in the back. If you want to turn around and see her bag, hold it up again, Alexa. What does it say? Carry joy. Amen. So some people are looking for joy. What else are you looking for when you come in here? Yell it out. Peace. Grace. What else are you looking for? New insights. What else are you looking for? What? Salvation. Salvation. Amen. What else are we looking for when we come in here? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Amen. What else are you looking for when you come in here? Strong connection to God. Anybody looking for anything else? Answers. Amen. What? Connection to other people. What did you say, Kaylee? Tranquility. There's a big word from a little girl. Tranquility. I, I'm looking for tranquility myself all the time these days. Tranquility. Peace. I'm looking to find out how I'm called to embody the kingdom of Jesus Christ on earth. But look at all those things. If you're looking for salvation, if you're looking for forgiveness, you're looking for the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. If you're looking for Jesus who is the Lamb. If you're looking to learn more about his word and his world and his wants for our lives, then you're looking for the rabbi, the teacher. If you're looking for the kingdom, like I'm looking for the kingdom, you're looking for the Son of God who is the, also the Messiah, the, or the anointed one of God. Now, I'm looking for the light of Christ in my life. Because, I mean, it's a dark world out there. And if, you, if you're my friend on Facebook, every year I put on the same picture, I think, from Martin Luther King Day. It's the quote, and it's part of a quote, that says, Darkness cannot drive out darkness. I'll read you the entire quote. It's from a book called The Strength of Love that was published in 1963, just five years before he was killed. Returning hate for hate multiplies hate, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So darkness can't drive out darkness. Only light can do that. 
But if we see a dark world, what are the things in the world that are dark? You said what, you, what you're looking for, but what are the things that are dark that keep other people from seeing Christ in the world? What's the darkness? What's the, the porch light that's out in other people's lives when it comes to seeing God? What stands in the way of seeing God in the world? Feel those things out too. Hate. Amen. What? Anger. Fear. Despair. What else? Greed. What else? Hopelessness, which is part of despair. They go hand in hand, don't they? Hopelessness and despair seem to be almost the same thing. All the things that would stand in the way of anyone seeing Jesus Christ in the world or seeing the light of God, that's what we are called to stand against. We're called to be a light to the nations, not just to each other, not just to ourselves. It's not enough just saying, I love to tell the story. You've got to tell the story. When is the last time you shared the peace of God and Jesus Christ with someone outside of this building? When is the last time you shared any with anyone your faith outside of this room or a Sunday school class or a Bible study or your small group? When is the last time you said to someone in the world, I have a Savior and I need to show him to the world? Or to say to someone, I once was lost and now I'm found. This is how I was lost. This is where my darkness was. When's the last time you turned the light on for somebody else? That's what we've got to ask ourselves all the time. Now, every time I read this particular passage from John's Gospel, and how does John's Gospel begin? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. John knows exactly who Jesus is. This is God coming into a human life. God incarnate, God the one we can touch and understand and see and feel because Jesus is like us. He's one of us. We understand him, don't we, better than the idea of a God that's far removed from us. We have a God in our midst who we can touch and, and learn from. And they're following him. And so he says to them, what are you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, where are you staying? And he said, come and see. Come and see. And they came and they saw where he was staying. They remained with him that day. It was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak about him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Simon Peter has a brother named Andrew. This is his shining moment in Scripture, boys and girls. This is it. This is where he does what he's called to do. And what does he do? He says to his brother Peter, Come and see, we have found the Messiah. Always reminds me of It's a Wonderful Life. How many of you saw It's a Wonderful Life this Christmas season? Anybody watch that one again? One of those old turkey movies that I got to see every year. And this year, I don't know why, but I cried like a baby at this movie. Because how does the movie start? Anybody remember how it starts? The first view that Clarence Angel gets of George Bailey? George is a kid. And they're, out, they're sledding on a hill. They're sitting on what? Not a sled. They can't afford a sled. This is back in the 1920s. They're on a snow shovel. And his brother Harry goes down the hill. And what happens to Harry? Remember? Falls through the ice, and George rescues him, and George can't hear out of his ear after that. Then later in the film, much later in the film, when George hits the bottom of despair because his business, and he's always done what's right. He doesn't want to do what's right. He wants to do what he wants to do. He wants to be selfish, but he cannot be selfish because he's got this inner thing in him that will not let him just do what he wants to do. So George does what's expected of him. George gets married. George has children. George goes to the building alone. He does what he's expected to do until his uncle, who's a little bit crazy, the one with all the, the strings tied on his fingers to remind him of everything that he's always going to forget. He loses the money. His business is going to go bankrupt. He's going to be put in prison, or his uncle would be put in prison if he let his uncle take the fall for what he has done. And he's in despair, and he goes to old man Potter, the banker in town, and asks to borrow money. And Potter says, what do you got for collateral? And he has a little insurance policy with a little bit of uh, money in it. And he says to George, you're worth more dead than alive. And George decides he's going to end his life to save his family. And Clarence the angel, now don't think angels get wings. Now this, that's the one, you know, every time bell rings, an angel does not get wings. They don't have wings. We've been through this before. But Clarence decides to show him what life would be like without him. When I started crying this time, I don't know why this one got to me, but he's standing in front of his brother Harry's tombstone. It says, Harry Bailey, who died as a child. And George says, Harry Bailey saved the lives of all those men on the transport ship because Harry was a war hero. He 
was on his way home that day. What did Clarence say to him? Harry didn't say this then because you weren't here to save Harry. You weren't here to save Harry. Harry couldn't save anybody else. Where would Peter have been without Andrew, huh? Where would Peter have been without Andrew to say, we have found the Messiah, and Andrew goes because he believes his brother. Unlike all the children who don't believe Pastor Terry, that somebody's handing out $20 bills out in the narthex or $100 bills, or they won't believe you or anybody in here. Y'all wouldn't believe me if I told you that there was gas for 10 cents a gallon. Because we're all so skeptical. We're all so hard-shelled right now that we can't believe anything anybody says. But what if somebody said, we have seen the Messiah. We've seen God's anointed one. What if you were the one to say to somebody who's addicted, I can tell you where to find healing? What if you were the one to say to somebody who's down on their luck, I can tell you where to find hope? What if you were to say to somebody who says, I've just screwed up my life so miserably, I can tell you where to find forgiveness and new life. I can tell you where to find love. What if someone says, nobody likes me, I have nobody in the world to depend on, I'm just ready to take my own life. And you said, I know where you can have a family. It's called Epworth United Methodist Church. Come with me. Come and see. Come and see the Messiah. What if it was up to you to be the one to say to the next Peter, this is your Savior? I'm never going to be Martin Luther King Jr. I'm not going to be someone who's so profound, but I may preach to somebody who's going to be the next Martin Luther King Jr. I may be somebody who inspires the next Moses. I never know. But if I don't say what's in my heart about Jesus Christ, then nobody knows, do they? Now I get paid to talk about Jesus, right? Right? Let's face it. Y'all give me a paycheck to preach the Word of God. Nobody's going to pay you a thing to preach the Word of God, but if you're not preaching, it doesn't matter what I say here. Unless somebody might happen upon us on a... And we've had some people who joined the church because they worshipped with us online during the pandemic. Some folks joined the church because they found us that way. A lady in another state sent me a cross when I said I lost my cross. There are folks who were in my former congregation, a lady who has since died, who said I worshipped with you every Sunday because she had moved away from her church and she knew me. But if it's not for you guys telling other people what you have found, what you've been looking for, no one is ever going to come to Christ. We're going to sing that song in just a few minutes, the... The I love to tell the story. And I want you to love to tell the story. I want you to sing it, but I want you to tell somebody about what Christ has done in your life. I want you to turn on the light for someone else because darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So what we have to do is share Jesus Christ with all that we have and all that we are. We've got to share him with what we say, with how we live, with how we forgive one another. Or no one will ever know the truth of Jesus Christ. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? Jesus, the light of the world. Isaiah was told. This is Isaiah. This is hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus. The Lord says, I will give you as a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Now, the first time someone was called a Messiah in Scripture was in the Old Testament, in Isaiah, probably around the mid-50s chapters. You know who was called a Messiah, anointed one of God? Cyrus of Persia. Cyrus of Persia, a Persian, a modern-day Iranian, not a Jew at the time, not at all, never became a Jew. He was called anointed by God because he did what? Here's your biblical quiz du jour. Mark will get this. If anybody else gets this, I'll give you the keys to my car. You can drive home in my car. See how sure I am that nobody's going to know this Old Testament little nugget of truth? Cyrus of Persia was the one who freed the Jews from the exile in Babylon. He's the one who kicked Nebuchadnezzar right in the behind and got rid of him and reestablished the people in their land. And God said, that's anointed from me. So if God can anoint a Persian dictator of old, what could God do in our lives if we allow God into our lives and into our hearts to work through us to bring others to Christ? He'll be a light to the nations. Not a light that's got its origin in you, but a light that reflects who Christ is. So I hope when you get up and sing, I love to tell the story that you will tell somebody about Jesus Christ. Not, not in a way that condemns or, or judges, but in a way that invites, because there are so many people living in darkness. So put the light on for them in Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, amen. I'm going to invite you now to 